Making Stuff Up, the podcast by the Quinney Arts Council team, where we talk to all kinds of creators about how they got interested in making stuff up. You're here with your hosts, Cody, Janet, and Heather. This week, we're talking to Ash Merle and Phil Barnes about their art forms of photography and CGI. Ash, Phil, welcome to the podcast. Thank, Thank you. you. Can you please introduce yourselves a little bit? Uh, my name's Ash, and I'm a creative. I guess I could really classify myself at this point. Um, used to be traditionally just a photographer. Over COVID, I've kind of learned CGI as well as video work, and we've just been building out the potential for my company. Hi, I'm Phil Barnes. Um, I've worn a lot of hats over the years. Uh, most of it as a graphic designer, got into web developing, software, and now I work with Ash doing videography and assisting on set. So have you guys always considered yourselves artists? Or creators or creatives? Uh, kind of. I, I never, I went to school for a industrial electrics. So actually when I grew up and went through college, I was going through as a kind of a linesman or as an engineer to do electrical stuff. I'd always known that I wanted to do something that wasn't that and knew that kind of photography would be the way to start doing that. I used to draw a lot and used to paint a lot. And then photography was the lazy version of that for me to start because it was instant, right? I could take a shot, take it to the, get it processed and it'll be done and move on. So that was kind of how I started, yeah. But uh, as far as always being creative, it's just, I don't know of any other way of living at this point. So I, even if I stopped doing photography or any other creative medium, I'd find something else that was uh, kind of creative in its purposes. Yeah, I would say I've been a creative soul from day one. I mean, I grew up doing art around the house as a child, lots of Lego work, <laughs> like any good healthy nerd. Um, I ended up in university for physics, but I did take fine arts courses while I was there and then changed direction and ended up in advertising and design. I'm gonna double back to your, what a little bit about yourselves. Where are you from? <laughs> in general? Complicated story. <laughs> Don't go too far back. Don't go too far back. Okay, <clears throat> born in England. I lived there till I was 13. Moved to France until I was 21. And then moved over to the metropolis of Stirling, Ontario. Where I uh, yeah, kind of settled down in this area. And then I've been here ever since. Yeah. And we're lucky. No, I was born in Quebec. Northern Quebec of all places. Uh, to British parents. We moved to Cornwall when I was very young. Grew up, raised whole kit and caboodle in Cornwall. And once married, we moved out this way. Now, growing up in different places, do you think that affected your art? Uh, yeah, dramatically. The, the French love their art. And they celebrate in a lot of different forms, from food to painting to music. Um, that love of art is what got me actually considering the fact that this could be a way of living and not so much like forget the business side for now just that became a part of me right so it really was like if you're going to do something do it with a joie de vivre that you just don't get if you just focus on like the kind of the elements of it so yeah mm -hmm. definitely i couldn't tell you. I have to imagine if I'd been somewhere else and doing something else, I'd have been someone else and thus my art would have changed. Uh, it's always just been kind of a hobby for me, something fun I did in my own time. So who's to say? Phil is a wee bit pragmatic. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a little. Just a tad. Ash, when you say that photography is, is your love or your passion with art right now when you first became involved with photography um, the methods and um, the design of photography was so different mm. can you maybe give us some background of what it was like when you started and how it's progressed um <laughs> yes so <laughs> this is, you're actually that's a really pertinent question because i think we're on the edge of another huge shift in the next six years is my guess so I, i've seen this before so um when i went out there and started learning how to do photography it was 35 millimeter and if you were a professional you're in the medium format um so i started learning how to process my own film and and do all that jazz and along came a camera called the 
Canon 10D, which was, it was mind blowing because it was a digital camera that didn't suck because up to then it was, digital cameras were terrible and photographers across the board, especially locally, were just like, that's not photography. If it's, if it's, on, if it's not on film, it's not photography. And I was like, no, I disagree. I think this is photography and I think you're just a stick in the mud. So it evolved into what it is today. I think we're evolving again. And this is why I've gone into learning CGs because I think we're actually on a change of where we before just had flat screen stuff. Now we're going to be able to take an environment like what we're in now, digitize it, and then basically manipulate it like we do in Photoshop, but in like far more like weird ways, which is very exciting as a creative because you know, it changed up some reality. So, yeah. Some artists prefer to stay with their medium in the way that they learned it. I feel like you like to keep learning as an artist and through new technology. Um, do you have some thoughts on that? Does it hold you back as an artist or does it help you? I, I think every artist is different. I mean, I've seen some artists that just stick to the same thing. I have one guy I follow on Instagram that all he does is he puts down a, a canvas on the floor. He has a paint bucket or a bucket usually that he drills a hole in, ties it to the ceiling and he spins it around and he just watches that sucker spin and spin and spin and make a whole bunch of different um, kind of shapes. And that's his art. I've seen that. It's awesome. It's awesome, right? It's yeah. mesmerizing. Yeah, it is yeah. mesmerizing. We want to try yeah. that in our own garage. You guys should. It'd be fun. And like, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, art is always about an imitation of life, right? Life in itself doesn't stay still. And so for me, my love of all mediums of art is just, you know, accepting the fact that life changes and it's different. And yeah, I, honestly, I see artists that do beautiful paintings, and I'm in awe of them, and they could quite easily learn to do that in a 3D environment and not feel any different. I love it when um, a sentence includes art and life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really juxtaposed. Um, family is a key dimension of everyone's life. Are you the only artist in your family, or do you take after someone, and is anyone following in your footsteps? <laughs> my start with the first I got lost there. yeah I was gonna say oh I'm sorry <laughs> so fam so surrounded by artists yeah so you're saying so yeah, I think everyone's an artist like I, I find it really hard because artist to me is a little bit of a catch-all right like Phil's an artist and that he can pick up pretty much anything and make it into what he needs so if I have a problem I can literally go to Phil and say okay this is doing this fix it and he'll find a way to develop a rig or some kind of technology that will kind of... This is a very generous way of saying that I find things and use them for the wrong reason. Exactly, yeah. And, mm -hmm. But that's an To a form. positive result, but yeah. yeah. That's pretty creative, though. You've got to be creative to think outside the box like that. I think, I think to define an artist and like, what we create is kind of it's lacking. You know, so I think everybody around me is an artist. You know, like we're all artists around this table in our own particular ways. Um, in my family, I have like my uh, youngest, she loves to do gymnastics and stuff like that, which is in itself an art form. Then I've got my oldest, she wants to do welding as an art. That, that When I see like that, that makes me excited, you know. So an artist for me is someone who's just enjoying and creatively changing the way they do things. It would be really great for your daughter to meet Amy, who was featured in our last Umbrella magazine, who is a, a welder, and mm -hmm. it would be really great yeah. um, mentorship. I will have there. to look back through that umbrella. Have you got creatives in your family? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, my wife dabbles. We love arts and crafts. In fact, uh, over the last... Like it's two months now. <laughs> we uh, we went to a place called Firing Time in Brighton, and they had take home kits for do DIY pottery. So we brought that home, and we each did a little bit of pottery. But uh, it's my daughters who really embraced the arts. Both of them fell in love with art young, and uh, particularly through high school because they had a brilliant art teacher, uh, Mr. Campbell, who has since retired, unfortunately, but. Uh, yeah, and both of them are significantly more talented than I am. And now, let's take a minute to thank one of our sponsors who made today's show possible, the Ontario Arts Council. 
For more than 55 years, the OAC has worked to provide grants and services to Ontario-based artists and arts organizations, supporting arts education and all forms of creative endeavors. Over the past two years, the OAC has invested over $78 million in communities across Ontario. Without the support of the OAC, this podcast would not be possible. Thank you to the OAC for your support and for all that you do for the arts communities. Uh, what makes a good photograph? Uh, Somebody likes it? Ah, okay. Yeah, I, I kind of like that answer, actually. I, th- I think that's a great answer. If, so, if just one person likes it, then it's successful. Okay. Right? There are no shitty photos. And that's the honest truth. Like, some of my favorite photos, um, all the ones that uh, affect me personally, are in all sense and purposes when you go through, like, traditional kind of, like, composition, lighting, all of that stuff. They're, they break every single one of those rules. Right? So that's, like, a photo is deeply personal. And, you know, it can, it can mean a lot. Like, you can have a photo that everyone will not look at and that one person will absolutely adore. Is humor part of your art? <laughs> is humor part? I hope so. I'm a bit Certainly of a jackass. Certainly a part of life. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, I think so. I think we, we try to, because we do commercial, right? So we have a kind of focus that we're doing, but we do like to have that little cheeky kind of elements to it. Like, yeah, especially with CG. Yeah. Yeah, been witnessed. I think back to some of the stuff we've put together, and yeah, yeah, some of it could be taken as quite. I would like to go. I would like to go further with it. I think. I think that's when I look at the humor in my work, over the like. So about about five years ago, so my mum passed away of cancer, and so a lot of my work reflected that darkness and that sadness, and also a bit more somber kind of look on life, and. I feel like that your art will reflect your emotions and how you go through life currently. And so I feel like as I become more at peace with it and I start to re kind of like enjoy my humor, um, I feel like that is going to be more and more in my photos you'll see over the next probably two or three years. You'll see humor become a lot bigger in, in, in the frame. When we can talk the clients into it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So would you say you think art is healing then? Mm, Sometimes. Cathartic maybe? Cathartic, yeah. Yeah. I feel like sometimes it can can hold you in a place where you you don't necessarily want to be sometimes. And that isn't always healing. So I've seen some artworks of some people and I'm like, just like step out of there for a second, you know, and like actually look outside beyond it because you can easily create something. Creating gives you a great sense of achievement and power, and that can in itself become intoxicating. Now, would you say over the last couple of years, has this shut-in COVID pandemic affected your art in any way? It felt really good to pick up a camera again. Like, we had, what, nine months? Close to, yeah. Maybe with a a, year. during one of those little breaks, I think we snuck in a job or two. Yeah. Like when the when things when relaxed, the, when the country opened up again and then closed down again and then opened up again and then closed down again, um, yeah. There's, I feel like COVID was really difficult to kind of develop as an artist, and so that's when I ended up learning a different medium, basically. And that medium in itself is actually just the biggest problem I find now is there is no starting point or no end point. With photography, you can only push it so far, right, before you start running into some walls. But we've eventually you got to push the button. Yeah, and exactly. Print, and print it or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But CG, you can just e- keep building it. and building and you can actually make it so it can build itself, which is in itself is quite incredible. So it's just kind of like the bucket on the string. So you started CGI during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. That was a big learning curve. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. I'd, I'd done it just before, like started to try and understand it and gave it up. And so when we got locked down, I just turned around and said, okay, I'm at home with two children at school, and uh, I, I needed to keep some sort of sanity. And so I said to my wife, I'm like, I'm going to learn a new skill. And she kind of went, okay, what are you going to learn? And I said, CGI. And to me at the time, it was just I wanted to take backgrounds out of photos and replace them with the things that I wanted and to look real. That's all I wanted. Mm-hmm. And it's 
gone quickly past that. So now we do animations, we build out things, and currently looking at digital sculpting. Well, I remember when you started first talking to us about CGI, mm -hmm. and the energy that you had about that was... I just, I just love anything that allows you to find out who you are and express who you are. And, you know, whether it be painting, whether it be, you know, carving a piece of rock, you know, whether it be, you know, pen and paper, it doesn't matter. It's just, I just get excited. I'm excited to be alive. So you said you picked up CGI during uh, the lockdown. I know a lot of other people turned to different forms of social media, like Netflix. TikTok and Instagram. <laughs> what, do Tiger you guys, King. what do you guys think about, like, Instagram photographers? I love them. I think they are amazing because they are out there like you want to you want to know how hard it is to churn out a piece of work every day go ahead like go onto your instagram and say you know i'm going to be an instagram guy for like one month but actually put some effort into it you'll quickly find that it's exhausting right the people that are there love it right and so they might have a weird medium where they might have i don't know like it doesn't matter like the camera doesn't matter it really people get so hung up on that like that's the one thing the old guards used to get really hung up on was like if it's not medium format it's not photography or if it's not film it's not photography and i'm just like screw that it's photography because everything between you and the lens is compromising that photo which is really difficult for people to hear because as soon as a photographer picks up the camera and puts it up against his eye it's no longer reality because now the photographer can tell you his story from his angle real estate photography like yeah. you know they talk they talk about trying to have it as as pure as possible i'm like good luck you know if there's like an antennae sticking out the roof like if we just remove that it'd be look 10 times better and they do and they get away with it all i think all art forms do it yeah. visual artists do it too they yeah. take out that ugly mailbox yeah all right so um do you guys consider yourselves mentors and if so what way yeah i've i've been mentoring a few different artists um it's depended on the artist, but there's different needs that are out there. So from, obviously from the lighting and stuff like that, which is the easy stuff to a bit more kind of esoteric as business and kind of developing out a brand that they can be proud of and that they can build out and be an artist for years versus kind of crash and burn, which I've seen a lot of artists do, which kind of that is hard because it's such a great medium to get into. And then when they start going, they're like, yeah, we're gonna do this. And, and the business side of it kind of like floats away on them. And then they don't actually pursue that properly. And then they get into trouble. The, uh, the starving artist is a thing and mm -hmm. it shouldn't be, but it is. And uh, yeah, gotta, gotta help, them, help them grow. Yeah, I think that's why collectives sometimes do well. You know, but not everybody yeah. wants to be a part of a collective. That, and Sometimes that's, they need that kick. That's kind of the concept behind AMP. So my my company's gone through a couple of phases. So originally it was just me. And then I decided to hire on Phil and back in 2016. Yeah, we had a big debate about yeah. this. Sorry. We had a big debate about this this morning, wasn't it? This we morning, were yeah. discussing yeah. So how long have we... And hanging out and working together now and so in 2016, 2016 brought Phil on, on board and the idea was to kind of get an idea of if I wanted to build this into a brand and not just me working as a person and so AMP is actually an agency so we actually have a lot of different artists across the world now who are working with us on different projects so I'm not limited to location because we have this wonderful thing called the internet that allows me to work with people so in our next project we have someone from Delaware, someone from Massachusetts, and someone from Holland working with us. And yeah, it just, it goes across the board now. So, so that's the agency cool. side of it. So, and so we, yeah, we have to collaborate and that makes sense, so. All right, so do you wanna tell us about the three most influential people in your lives and how they impacted you? I think my mom was like, she was like my, cheerleader of sorts because she was always like you know you can do this you can do anything you put your mind to and she really gave me a solid sense of self so that you know when I went out there and I was confronted with no's I was like yeah I just don't care and then kept on going <laughs> so that was just too stupid to notice like you know to be able to do it right so I just I don't know just th that was the, the first one that kind of really steps out to me you know there's my um, my 
mom's cousin. I don't know what the relationship to me would be. Uh, but she actually told me that uh, <laughs> I would be uh, a good artist and could actually do photography. And, and I was like 16 at the time. And so that's where the photography started from, was just learning how to, you know, mm-hmm. kind of do photography on like an art form kind of manner to start. So, yeah. How are Phil? you the third one? I mean, obviously your parents are the most influential people in your life. They genetically and socially make you who you are. But uh, I'd say the outside of that the person who has uh i don't want to say formed the way i think uh that's hardly accurate but allowed me to be aware of a particular shape of the way i think would have been douglas adams the author Mm -hmm. um i have read the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy series more times than I can count. It's the thing I fall back on whenever I'm upset and unhappy. And sometimes it's the thing I pick up when I'm really happy. But uh, yeah, I I think it's a solid source of my sense of humor. So you know the answer to the universe. I do. I even know the question. Oh my goodness, and I thought that question was in our brain bowl. Oh, it's time for a brain bowl question. Do you guys want to pick from the bowl? Go for it, Ash. All right. Good luck. Why am I closing my eyes to do this? (laughs) (laughs) Oh. He wants to put it back. Yeah. You can Uh, throw it back and get it. Yeah, you can. There's no rules with the brain bowl. You can have anyone fictional as your imaginary friend. Who do you choose and why? I think... If I could, and this is going to be like super dark, but the uh, the main character from The Green Mile. Wow. The one on death row. Mm-hmm. I can't remember his name. I feel bad. Did Tom Hanks pay the Well, it's pay Michael Clark Duncan or Duncan yes. Clark. I always get the last name yeah. mixed up. But, uh, so he, uh, to, to be friends with someone like that, even just for a dinner date and just to chat and to, like his ability to be so kind is chilling and that's what makes the movie so good it's not not just his ability to be kind but his ability to be kind in the face of such adversity horror yes. all focused at yeah. him mm-hmm. yeah just for being who he is yeah mm-hmm. that, that would be really honoring to, to talk to someone like him phil good luck oh i've already told you this one but uh We're gonna it would be like robin like williams's character from right. the fisher king mm-hmm. right. I, again i can't remember the character's name but I think it's probably the truest version of Robin Williams, the real man. Um, there's something very sad about the man, and yet he still wants desperately for you to smile and laugh. It's like Patch Adams. And, uh, oh, I loved Patch Yeah, same yeah. vibe. Yeah. Same vibe. <clears throat> Janet, what's your answer to that question? I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just thought, oh, Janet would have a good yeah, one. Yeah, you just know what, know for it. me, it's Scout from To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, sweet. Yeah, I love Scout. I love her dad, too, but Scout's got... I've got a bit of Scout in me. That's why I read that next line. The next line. Mm-hmm. How about you guys? Going around the table. Um, I decided just now, the dude from The Big Lebowski. <gasps> oh, my yeah, God, she's the dude. Choice. Technically, I am a licensed or er, an ordained priest through the Church of Dude, where dude is priest. Um, and I, I would... He would be basically be God on my shoulder since that is the church. So I think that's who I want as my imaginary the friend. Dude. Now let's take a minute to thank one of the sponsors who made today's show possible, Bay of Quinty Tourism. If you're looking for something fun to do in the Quinty region, then look no further than Bay of Quinty Tourism. They have it all planned out for you. Grab a copy of the 8th edition of the Bay of Quinty Discovery Guide to start planning your next adventure in the Quinty region. Uh, So how do you balance the business side of your work with the artistic part of your work? Um, As someone who's done, like, every single mistake possible in business to try and, like, figure it out, um, balancing business is, is less of an art form than people like to make it out to be. And it's just about understanding what, you know, your 
what you actually do and how your kind of work can be of value to other people. And so when you start to understand that, then you can actually build forwards based on that. Um, business is really hard because every brand is something different. And that's what's really unique. That's why my company actually just, we specialize in like working with brands is because it's so different each time and everything is custom. And that's the fun part about it. And just really understanding, you know, why they do what they do or, you know, who they do the work for is really key for that business. Mm -hmm. Would you say with business, you have to understand your audience, but as an artist, it's not necessarily about your audience. It's <laughs> about what your gift. Yeah. So is. I think, I think as an artist, you, you kind of build out an understanding of your own audience of who you'd like to, you know, kind of show your art to. And then if you're really lucky that, audience has you know like the ability to become a business too mm -hmm. um i think in today's age where you have access to the internet you don't need a really big audience mm. which is a lot of people kind of look at it and go wow i'm in belleville there's only what do we sixty thousand people here now maybe sixty five thousand. that's a small market mm -hmm. by far and so if you're an artist looking at a market like that going oh you know like there's maybe maybe there's one person in sixty thousand or fifty thousand that likes what you do, and that's daunting because that's a really small number of people. But here's the catch: the world isn't sixty thousand or fifty thousand people. There's a lot of people in the world across Se the world. Seven billion plus, I think. Exactly, seven billion plus. So suddenly you've got access to even your smallest of niche has a viable market, mm -hmm. and so it's just understanding how to kind of show what you do, you know. So back to the artist in you. Yes. If, um, if you could give a gift to the world as an artist, what would it be? I think understanding and just kind of just being able to understand what, yeah. I feel I, I enjoy helping people to see what the brand sees. So, you know, when you guys see art and beauty around, so I want to make sure that people, when they see your photos, understand that about you. So that for me with my art form is like how to communicate clearly that why. Mm, I like it. I do think that when I look at your photos, I can sometimes like just zooming through Instagram. I'm like, that's an ash photo. So yeah. you are kind of. I've developed a voice. Yeah. That's from doing a lot of photos. Like a lot of people don't know what I do because they don't see most of the things I do. Um, it's like the, the iceberg, right? So you only see like the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of bad photos below there. And I feel like right now I'm in a really happy spot right now with my work, my art, that I can tell my story in a clear way without it being muddled by confusing techniques or, you know, not knowing how to do something. You know, that's, that's always been it. I've always loved art and I've always loved light. And so those two kind of like merge nice together. So the business of art is always fascinating to me. Like, you know, back in the late eighties, early nineties, Robert Bateman was mass producing prints and the museum of Canada said, or the um, art gallery of Canada said, we're not putting your stuff in here. Yeah. And He's like one of the best, no. One of the hyper realists, yeah. Wildlife artists in the world, but we couldn't, he, you know, he just couldn't produce enough to give, and the, the, mm -hmm. the demand for his work was out there. So he started doing prints, and there was another artist on the East Coast, he does tiles, Sid Dickens. Because he was mass producing these tiles, it wasn't art all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? I think it's a shame. I mean, there's so much that is done in the world that isn't classified art um, by anyone, including the person doing it, that is arguably a creative exercise. And if the result is something um, that is evoking some kind of emotional response, be it pleasure or pain or whatever, then maybe it is art, right? I mean. Uh, I've told you I'm a software developer. Uh, there's an argument to be made that some of the ones and zeros I string together um, result in a form of art. Managing data can be art. It's not a particularly popular art form. I <laughs> can't imagine too many people hang it on their walls, but I know there are 
hundreds and maybe even thousands, man, I don't think our client base is that big yet, but who are looking at it, putting it to use, and using it as a communication tool to thousands of people, yeah. tens of thousands of recipients of our text mm-hmm. messages. Well, I see that is there's a, I mean, there's the creative brain, there's the analytical brain, and sometimes there's people who are close in the middle. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure how much difference there is between the two. I think it's just the angle you approach the end result, right? If you're, you could argue that Robert Bateman, for instance, was denied access to uh, our large Canadian museums because it's not art, because he was too analytical. His paintings were photographs. Mm-hmm. And as far as many were concerned, it's not art because it's just mechanical reproductions. Uh, never mind the amount of skill or the thrill or the joy the man took in dropping each little microscopic bead of paint on that painting. Uh, There's lots of artists on the internet now using technology to create their creations, CNC routers and laser engravers and... Even as far as NFTs. Yeah. Let's talk about those over here. Can you help our our audience out and um, tell us what's an NFT? NFTs was a non-fungible token. So think of it this way. It's a piece of technology. Okay, it's a smart contract. So it's an agreement between, say, you and I. Okay, so I have a... Now don't do that. (laughs) So I have this bowl bowl in front of me with a whole bunch of paper in it. Okay, and so I make a rendering of this or a photograph of this and I put it onto the blockchain. Okay, so in order to authenticate it, right, you have to actually kind of encode it onto the blockchain. I sell you that piece of code, right? So it's like a receipt. So now you have that receipt for the bowl and the lovely noises that it makes. Okay, <laughs> that's that's exactly what an NFT is. So it's a receipt for saying that you have purchased my art. Mm. Now the nice thing about NFTs, and we're gonna hear more and more about these in the near future, is uh, they are traceable. So if you go and sell that bowl pitcher to, you know, either of these guys, right, and you make some money on it, I can code into that that I get 10% of the sale. Oh, wow. So it's... So now... That pays forward. So now it's starting to get interesting, right? Yes, it is. So now... Arguably a pyramid Janet. (laughs) So now Janet turns around and she knows Billy Bob in Texas who loves bowls. And she sells that bowl pitcher that was originally sold for 50 bucks, right, and then purchased for 75 bucks. She now sells it for 75,000. So that's the magic behind NFTs is there is a constant handshake between the people who have owned it and the people who have created it. It makes me feel like there's a similarity between music copyright and NFTs for visual art. Am I on the right I think we're going to see music go onto NFTs. So if you want to listen to a new song from an artist, you can download it. But that is like taking a copy of the NFT. So the original will basically be a copy of the original NFT. Mm -hmm. Whoever owns that original NFT will be getting all the royalties. So NFTs are a technology, and a lot of people try to pass them off as like pictures on the internet. You hear people say, well, you can just right click and save, right? But you don't own that photo, Mm -hmm. right? So, and so for people like us, in the near future, we're probably gonna switch to that. So when we sell you a photo, for example, you have the receipt, so you own that copy of that photo that is yours now hmm. and this is why copyright lawyers are hating this stuff well i love it yeah because you know jeez yeah maude lewis sold her stuff for five cents it now goes for forty thousand. exactly and she doesn't get but a penny he's of it. getting the forty thousand. like for my company we keep it very simple so if you purchase the photo you get to use it in the manners that you need as long as you're not reselling it uh, we keep it really clean and simple because that's what i believe in my, my core values are simplify it. If it's too difficult, simplify it. Yeah. So. But if it came to the point where someone's trying to resell your yeah. photos of. This would just eliminate that because yeah. I could say to you, sell it if you want, go for it. But yeah, you'll I'll, I'll profit you'll from get it the, still, yep. right? Mm-hmm. So I won't and have to worry about that. And that's the way it should be. Absolutely. They, you know, 
if you create something, you put something out in the world, that intellectual property has value, right? The value of that property is completely dependent on who's purchasing it, right? So Mercedes is not worth any more than a Volkswagen, for example. The concept of it is worth more. You're driving a Mercedes, you're not driving a Volkswagen. They both get you from A to B. Speaking of comparisons, it's time for a would you rather question. Would you rather? Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I would rather Mike. drive a Volkswagen than a Mercedes. Just really? saying. Yeah. Have you ever been I'm, in a Mercedes? I'm with you, Janet. I love, uh, I lo- so I love my Volkswagen. Would you rather buy a cottage or go to Hawaii every year for 10 years? In the current real estate market, <laughs> 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 I would own that cottage and sell it <laughs> and then live in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best answer, except it's would you rather choose one or the other? Um, That's would, the rules. I would probably do the Hawaii thing because the college is responsibility. So you go up there. It's like another house you have to clean, another house you got to insure, another house you got to heat, put water in, hydro. Oh, it's just giving me hives thinking about it, actually. So, yeah. Phil? I'm the exact opposite. I'd buy the cottage but and then, then you'd sell move my it. house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would find a way to make that cottage all year round yeah Yeah. and uh, i would find some very devious way of convincing my wife that that was the right decision you are one step away from bushman though oh 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. cody oh i'm gonna live in the cottage okay yeah oh being away from people Mm, that's the sweetest deal maybe it's a ginger i was gonna say maybe (laughs) it's a red hair yeah (laughs) no i'm a a cottage too yeah i'm going to hawaii thank you i love cottages Uh, But maybe I love them so much because I don't have to take care of one. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I do love Hawaii. Yeah, I do too. But See, I'm the color of printer paper, so I think Hawaii is just going to be a little bit burny for me. Mm. Mm. No, the right sunscreen. There's a bit of a breeze. Just wear a hat. Good pair of shades. You have the best sunglasses. Can they see my sunburn on the podcast? (laughs) (laughs) No. I was joking. Phil has a sunburn. (laughs) So does Janet. I was joking to Phil earlier. I'm like, did you sit too close to your monitor? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's rough. All right. So what do you guys uh, want people to understand about photography and CGI? Philip? Oh, this one's easy. The camera doesn't take the photo. The computer doesn't make the image. There is a significant amount of skill and talent that goes into any of these uh, creative uh, things that rely on technology and hardware to accomplish a goal. The equipment is not the source of the work. It is a tool, a fancy, expensive camera. In the wrong hands, it is useless. Which is why he puts in my settings for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I can use it. Do you guys have any advice for anybody that wants to get into this? I have a really solid understanding of what you like getting into this. Because the first thing you'll do is you'll get pulled in 17 different directions. Because you'll get a camera and then you'll start taking really nice pictures of your dog. And then suddenly it's like, oh, can you take pictures of kids? And then you do your neighbor's kids photos for them and then they show them on the internet and then suddenly there's two more people are asking for kid photos and then four more five more ten more that's how it works i always tell people it's like people will hire you for what they see you do so don't show the things you don't want to do and that's a really important thing for artists because if you hate painting flowers and you put flowers on your portfolio that's what you're going to paint Right. If you really wanted to be painting rocks, put rocks on your portfolio. It's yeah. that simple. And people will try and direct you. They'll be like, "Well, no one wants to buy a rock. Paint some flowers." No, don't do that. <laughs> don't compromise. No, I think that goes with for any artist could actually identify with mm-hmm. that. Writers, any, mm-hmm. any business can identify Absolutely. with that. You shouldn't let your business steer who you are right? Your business is not in control. You should be in control. You choose what you're selling to your clients, Mm -hmm. service, product, whatever it may be. You choose it and then you find the audience to buy it. Don't let the audience tell you what your business is. All right. So time for our final question. If you guys could be remembered for one thing, what would it be? I like it. 
take the lead, mate. I'm, uh, I'm looking at you like, please go. I'm juggling Remembered this one. for one thing. Remembered uh, for one thing. Oh, I don't know. Oh, joie de vivre. There you go. Yeah, that's you've one. got that. Yeah. That's the French accent, for. is that? Oui, oui. <laughs> Well, this is my French Phil, accent. Phil, correct like, him. Well, if you're yeah. in the movies, the British some, accent is a French accent. Your love, your love of life. That's all, that's all, I want to be known for that, right? So, yeah, that comes off. Yep. Yeah. I Phil? hope so. I don't know. That's a tough one. I, you make some mean pierogies. <laughs> you should be known as the pierogi man. The pierogi guy? Yeah, I don't make pierogies. I burn them nicely, though. Um, I don't know. I, I think I'd rather people remembered what I had left behind I guess my kids I'd rather my daughters were remembered for what they did and then I can take a little side credit for helping make them who they are love it that is such a good answer I felt put on the spot with that question I don't think I could it's answer a hard it one. I'm gonna take that answer Thanks. <laughs> that's a good can, one. Can, we, can we mirror those can I turn that into an NFT and sell it to you you could but I think we're almost out of time mm. unfortunately <laughs> we are I see oh, how but it you're is. gonna miss okay. Ash's yodeling routine no we Ooh, won't give it to us let's hear it it's 35 minutes 35 I got the tap yeah. shoes in the car <laughs> Tap and yodeling, I nice. I put on the, the lederhosen. <laughs> lederhosen? <laughs> yeah. I had a set of that when I was a kid. This does not surprise me. This is a, yeah. He's anyway. Irish. And he, what, what, what? How does that happen? <laughs> My parents are strange people. <laughs> They're awesome. Yes, you apples don't like, fall far from the tree. You act like drinking in college is not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Thank you, Ash and Phil. We learned a lot today including some great information about NFTs that we are going to deep dive into in a future podcast. If you would like to learn more about Ash and AMP Media, check out Ash Mural Creative on Instagram and ampvisualmedia.com. Thank you for listening today. I'm your moderator, Cody, signing off and telling you to always be making stuff up.